So after I made my last video, I had some additional things that I thought of in terms of Warhammer tips, and I also had a few people give me some suggestions of things that they also thought I should add. And I thought more and more about it, and I figured it would probably be a good idea to make a series of videos and just start from the very beginning as like a new player introduction slash new player guide into playing Return of Reckoning uh, Warhammer Online. So to start from the beginning, uh, your very first choice when you load up the game is what faction you're going to play. And this does play a pretty big role in your overall experience to the game. And it really depends on which faction you prefer. The Order side is obviously the quote-unquote good guys. Elves, Dwarves, Humans. And they have a lot of really interesting classes and... There's a pretty good population. I'm not entirely sure how the population imbalance is right now from what I understand. There's more destruction players during the EU peak time and there's more order during the North American peak time. But as far as I understand that does change and you really can't use that as, or you can but you probably shouldn't use that as a guide whether you want to play each faction or not. So on the destruction side you have the chaos humans the Dark Elves, and, of course, the Greenskins, my faction and uh, race of choice. Now, one thing to know that the classes on either side have kind of mirrored classes that, are, that play very similarly, whether you play, say, a Shaman or an Archmage, or if you play a Choppa or a Slayer, they're different in the way that they play, but the classes are essentially mirrored to where you're going to have a similar playing experience when you choose one or the other. So to kick things off first, uh, I'll start with the green skins because that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, you have the Black Orc, which is the green skin tanking class. They're overall a, a really strong tank, and at the higher renown rank levels, I'm to understand that they can also do quite a bit of damage as a two-hand weapon user. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on all the classes just because for one that would make a really long video and two I haven't played a lot of the classes and I don't want to really put my opinion on them when I haven't played them myself yet. But yeah so Black Orc, good tank, it's the Greenskins tank. Choppa is the next class we're going to look at. Choppas are dual wielding melee DPS characters. Uh, pretty fun to play from the little bit that I've had. They've got a lot of good utility and are overall good class to play as. Next on the list is the Squig Herder. They are a ranged DPS pet class. They can also do melee from what I understand. You've got the Shaman up next. They are the Greenskins healing class. They can also do ranged DPS but of course most of the time people will expect you to be a healer. They have a pretty interesting mechanic where you actually weave both dealing damage and healing. And I have a level 10 uh, shaman that I've been playing and I've been enjoying it a lot so far. The next race we're going to look at is the Chaos, starting with the Chaos Chosen, which is the tank class for the Chaos. Another uh, good class, they've got some interesting auras and they're overall a really solid tank. The melee DPS class for Chaos is the Marauder. Uh, overall good class, they have an interesting mechanic where they can change the mutation of their arm in order to better adapt themselves to the fight. So let's say one is better at single target, one is better at area of effect damage, things like that. Next is the Magus or Magus or however you would like to pronounce it. They're a long range uh, DPS class. They have a stationary demon pet that they can also summon. Good damage dealer and uh, excels at AoE damage from what I understand. And finally for the Chaos, the healer class Zealot. They're a really good healer, a very good basic intro healer. They don't really have a special mechanic that you have to worry about so if you're looking at trying out healing they're a good place to start. On to the final destruction race, which is the Dark Elves. Now, I haven't played any Dark Elves yet, so I'm not really going to try to explain each one of these too much. Starting with the Witch Elf, they are the only stealth class on destruction uh, with the invis invisibility ability to 
not be seen by enemy players or monsters, which is a really cool thing. I've seen a lot of witch elf gank squads helping to keep enemies from posterns. They can also get into keeps and destroy siege weaponry, which is a really good thing to have. The Sorceress, another long range uh, casting class, DPS, range DPS. The Black Guard, which is the Dark Elves tank. Uh, I do understand that they are quite good at AoE. Um, I'm not very familiar with them beyond that, but they are the tank for the Dark Elves. The Disciple of Cain is the healers for the Dark Elves. They are a dual sword wielding healer class, meant to be more of like a battle healer. And from there, we're going to move on to the Order side, starting first with the Dwarves. So for the Dwarves, first we have the Rune Priest, which is their healing class. The Iron Breaker, which is the Dwarf Tank. The Slayer, which is the melee DPS for the Dwarves. Again, similar to the Choppa in playstyle, from what I understand. The Engineer, which is the long-range DPS class for the Dwarves. They also can set down a stationary set of turrets that they can use in battle. And of course they do have uh, some stuns and snares and other interesting things. Moving right along to the humans, start off with the Witch Hunter, which is of course the counterpart to the Witch Elf. It's another stealth class that can go invisible, sneak into keeps and around enemies, and is a uh, good melee damage dealer. Next is the Bright Wizard, which is a long-range mage class for the humans. They deal a lot of damage from what I understand, but they can also damage themselves along with their damage. The Warrior Priest, which is the frontline melee healer for the humans, similar to the Disciple of Cain, where they get up in the mix of the battle and fight while they heal. The Knight of the Blazing Sun, which is the tank class for the humans, they apparently have some pretty good buffs and things. I'm not overall very familiar with them, though. Moving on to the elves, we've got the Archmage, which is supposed to be the counterpart to the Shaman. Uh, can deal damage and heal at the same time, but is the main healing class for the elves. The Swordmaster, which is the tank class for the elves. Not, again, very familiar with them. I do see a lot of two-hand wielding, um, two-hand sword wielding Swordmasters out there. So maybe that's something that they excel in. I think they have some barriers and things as well. The Shadow Warrior, which is a uh, archer slash melee class, most prominent at long range from everything that I've seen. And finally, the White Lion, which is the melee DPS class for the elves. They also have a pet lion that they can use in battle, and they seem like a pretty good DPS class. So after doing a little bit of research, and there's a lot of great videos out there if you're having some trouble deciding on what you want to play, there's really good guides out there for which class is you know, probably more suited to what you want to play, but of course the very best thing you can do is just make something jump in, try it out, see if it fits you. So jumping right into the game, they do give you a quick tutorial to let you know, you know the basic controls of the game, how to move and everything. If you're familiar with MMORPGs, all of this should come second nature to you, but I figured I'd throw it in here anyways. You've got your intro quest giver that gets you started on your path. The first at least five to ten levels, you're going to be just following this linear path, doing quests and learning your way through the world. One thing that you'll notice right away is you actually have two uh, ranks that you have to rank up. One is your career rank, which is known as your level in most MMORPGs. Um, it goes from level 1 to level 40. Once you hit a maximum of 40, you're done with that. Uh, the other one is called your Renown rank, and this is your PvP or RVR level. This is obtained by killing enemy players, doing keep sieges, and things like that. They also teach you about these interesting lore items um, that give you Tome of Knowledge entries. A lot of times you'll find these just out in the world on your own and they don't necessarily correspond to a quest, but they can give you some pretty interesting rewards, so definitely be on the lookout for these. After that, we're gonna go ahead and turn in our quest, and when we level up here, something to note, when you get level up and you get new abilities, you're actually given your abilities right from the start. You don't have to go to a trainer anymore and learn the abilities, you're just given them automatically when you level up. 
A cool feature is that when you do pick up quests, it does give you this nice red circular area on the map where, you know, the general area that the quest will be completed. So it's usually pretty easy to find where you need to go. You heard me mention the Tome of Knowledge before. It's actually a really interesting idea and I wish that more games would have thought to do something like this. It has a list of basically all the knowledge that the game contains built into it. So all the enemies that you defeat, monsters that you defeat, um, all the achievements that you earn, the titles that you earn, the rewards that you earn, all of your quests and objectives are in there. Um, and, mo and most importantly for Return of Reckoning, the live event items are in there as well for when the server hosts the various live events, which they do all the time, that have interesting rewards and things that you can earn. Looking at the character screen, it should look familiar. Again, if you're used to playing MMORPGs, it has all your different slots for your items. There are some extra items that are kind of unique to Warhammer, um, such as the event item slot. It, a lot of the events will give you something that goes into this slot that's usually temporary for, say, 10 days, 20 days, whatever, that just gives you a small boost to your stats that will help you out for that duration. Also, there is a quote-unquote transmog ability in this game. Um, there's an appearance tab where if you check it, you can slot items into the corresponding slots for your armor. So if you put a helmet in the helmet slot, it overwrites the look of your current helmet slot. So you can hang on to items if you like them a lot and use them later as an appearance. And looking at the inventory real quick, there's not anything like bags that you have to collect and slot in or anything. You do have inventory expansion that you can pay to buy. And of course it does go up in price as you get further down, but it's generally pretty affordable and I would definitely recommend getting those slots unlocked as you can. And they provide you with a free mount uh, right when you start the game that's usable at level two. It's a pretty basic mount. It only gives you a 25% speed boost and you get knocked off if anybody hits you while you're riding it. But it's still nice to have that because the first mount that you get after that isn't until level 16. So definitely make use of that and don't accidentally sell it like a friend of mine did. Once you quest through the first area, you'll come across a camp that has a rally master in it. Rally masters are pretty interesting. For one, they're where you set your rally point. Of course, eventually you'll probably set this in your main city to get there quickly, especially since you can only use your Book of Binding once every hour. But beyond doing that, Rally Masters are also where you can check your influence with that particular chapter and obtain your rewards for that chapter. And you're probably wondering now, what is influence? So every chapter of the game that you participate in, and a chapter is generally like you'll get to a camp and that'll be chapter one, then you, when you move on to the next quest hub it'll be chapter two, and so on. Every time you reach one of these, you'll have the ability to earn influence in this area. So as you complete public quests, or in the case of RVR as you do battle objectives and defeat enemy players, you earn influence in that chapter. And as you hit certain milestones, you can obtain a choice of rewards from these uh, Rally Masters. At the beginning of the game, it'll be really easy to earn influence and the rewards will be pretty mediocre. But as you get further in the game, especially towards like end game RVR, these rewards will be much better and it'll take a lot longer to obtain them. So in PvE, the fastest way to earn these influence rewards is these public quests. They're areas within the game where there's essentially an active quest going that anybody in that area can participate in just by doing whatever the quest says. So if it says kill a hundred orcs, everybody in that area who kills an orc gets added to that total tally. And then once it gets to a hundred, it'll move on to the next stage of the public quest, which might be to either kill new kinds of enemies or collect new items and things like that. And usually the final stage ends with either champions or hero enemies, which are much tougher enemies, that you generally have to work together to be able to defeat. So once you do enough of the public quests or other stuff to max out your influence, make sure you head back to the Rally Master and get your rewards. Try to think forward, and is this going to help me in the future? Is it going to help me right now? Obviously for the first 10, 20, maybe even 30 levels, it's not going to make that big of a difference what you pick. 
but definitely once you get into the 30s and towards 40, it makes a bigger difference what you want to take. At this point is when you really start needing to decide what you want to do in the game, because if you are planning on doing end game RVR, which is the realm versus realm combat, commonly known as PvP player versus player combat, if you're planning on doing that, you need to start working on your renown rank now. One of the best ways to level both your level and your renown rank at the same time, or should I say your career rank and renown rank at the same time, is by doing scenarios. Now, RVR scenarios are similar to like Battlegrounds and World of Warcraft and things like that, where you queue up for the scenario, you wait until there's enough players to do it, you hop in, and it'll be a certain battle objective that you have to complete to win the scenario. So when you get into the scenario, it'll pop up with a little window asking if you're ready to jump in now or wait or you can decline. Just note if you do decline, you will get a debuff that will not let you join another one for a certain amount of time. So make sure that if you're not ready to do one yet, you might want to wait on queuing for one. But once you get in, you'll be greeted with this party window where you can kind of adjust what party you might want to be in. It's usually best to have at least one healer per party if you have enough healers available to do so. One healer and one tank. Um, but of course, when you're queuing up for these things, if you're not going in with a pre-made party, you're just kind of left with whatever you have. Also make sure that you grab the repeatable quest for the scenario when you jump in. It'll be the NPC with the little blue circle with the books on it above their head. Those are repeatable quests. And every time you win the scenario, you can do that quest again, and it's a really good way to earn both experience and uh, emblems. So in this particular scenario, the objective is a capture the flag objective. Uh, both destruction and order have their own flag that needs to be taken and captured. Most people are pretty familiar with what capture the flag is. Do take note that in the middle of the map, there is a drop-off point as well if you can't get it all the way back to your base. Generally, this is used if the enemy team has your flag at the same time. It gives less points for capturing it than taking it back to your base does. But if the enemy team has your flag and you have no way to recover it, it's a better option than losing the points altogether. Moving on from there, um, I do want to talk about the war report. The war report's a really cool function. It shows you all of the different things that are going on within the world at that given time, from what keeps are under siege to what battle objectives are being fought over, and even shows where players are engaging on like public quests and other things. And you can also use this war report to teleport every 20 minutes. So say that it says there's a keep under siege in this area, you can click that, hit go, and it'll teleport you to the closest camp in that area. Do be warned that this doesn't always work out as, as well as you intend. Places like Dragon Wake, if you try to use the War Report for the Keep or RVR, it'll put you in the PvE section and you'll have a really long run to get to where you want to go. So the War Report is not always the best thing to use, but it is a really good feature to have. When you do get into RVR, especially you know open world RVR, um, definitely make sure to check the open parties and open war band section here. If you don't have anyone else to play with, this is the next best way to find players to group up with to do these battle objectives and to do the keep sieges. The game is really not that solo friendly. You can solo and you can make it work, but it's designed really to be played with other players. So if you're going to go do some roaming and killing enemy players and doing battle objectives, especially keep sieges, Try to get into a, a party or a war band if you can't get into one in the looking for group channel or another means. The open parties tab is the next best way to do it. Speaking of the battle objectives, so every zone has these objectives that you can take for your faction as long as they're not locked. If they have a lock on them, like a little padlock symbol, that means you can't take them. But if you can take them, you always want to try to capture these for your faction. A lot of them will spawn these supplies that you can take. In this case, the order hat or the destruction hat. I'm playing order. That's not really in my wheelhouse normally. Um, the destruction had supplies hitting, sitting there, so I was able to steal them, which gave me some influence and renown. And then once I capture 
the flag for order for my faction, it'll spawn supplies for the order that I can pick up, and then I have to carry those back and turn them in. And depending on where you're at, the, these tier 1 zones don't have keeps for me to turn them into, so we'll just have to find the flag turn in point. It's probably over by the war camp, but I'm just not really familiar with order war camps right now. Uh, but we'll turn those in and those will give us not only our influence and our renown for us, but it also helps the zone overall in the later zones where we're trying to level up our keeps. You'll see people coordinating war bands to gather up all these supplies and turn them in to level up the keeps. And speaking of the war camps, a couple things here. So you've got a few interesting items you can use. There's these portals here that will take you to the various battle objectives on the map. That's a really good way to get back into the fight if you die and you have to release and resurrect back at the war camp. This will get you back into the fight a lot quicker that way. Also, um, here in the capital cities, you can find the Renown Vendors, where you can buy weapons and armor and things that you've either earned by getting your Renown rank high enough, or you can turn in the emblems and medallions that you earn from doing RVR to buy these various items. Medallions are earned out in the open world doing RVR, and the emblems are earned from doing the scenario RVR. So a very brief, dumbed-down way of... <laughs> of how the RVR works, it's split up into both pairings and tiers. So zones are linked together by pairings. You'll have like Ekron and Mount Bloodhorn together where it's essentially two zones, but they're paired together to where they affect each other and you're trying to fight over both. And then generally with the tiers, once you move on to the next one, you'll want to capture that one. It's, it's a supply line from one to the other. Once you get to tier 2, because tier 2 and 4 are all together, um, you have to be level 16 for tier 2, you'll basically be fighting to take over one zone, and then once that zone is locked down after you've taken both the keeps and all the battle objectives and the zone locks, then you're going to move on to the next zone to try to take it with the goal of eventually pushing all the way to the forts and then to the city siege. But that's a lot for another video. <laughs> All right, well, I think I'm going to end the video here. This is already um, a pretty long video, and I know I had to simplify and skip over some things, but I didn't want this video to be extremely long. So we're going to break this up into little sections. This was just kind of like an intro. If you guys like this a lot and this gets a lot of good feedback, we'll continue and we'll do more in-depth uh, information on things moving past Tier 1 and getting into a little more intricacies of things. But I figured this was just a good way to start things off and kind of give a basic overview to starting your career in Return of Reckoning. But I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, please hit that like button. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you thought, what you'd like to see, all that good stuff. Um, subscribe if you have not already. I'm primarily doing Warhammer videos. I am throwing in some other ones here and there as I play other games. But being that Return of Reckoning is my main game right now, this is what I'm planning on mainly doing for the foreseeable future. So if you do enjoy, subscribe. I'd love to see you again. And uh, thanks for all the support, and we'll see you in the next video.